Welcome to this week's TDD Weekly Report for the week ending April 7th, 2018. And first up, this is from popularscience.com. Um, MIT is making a device that can hear the words you say silently, and you'll see the picture here. The guy's wearing some kind of a device that looks, I don't know, kind of like a weird microphone, but it runs along the side of his face there. Well, students from MIT have created a prototype device dubbed Alter Ego that can recognize the words you mouth while silently talking to yourself and then take action based on what it thinks you're saying. And I'll try to pronounce this without slaughtering it, but the person's name is Arnav Kapoor, a master's student at the MIT Media Lab Division of the Massachusetts Institute of Technology that focuses on the intersection of people and technology and author of the paper stresses that the device doesn't read thoughts or the random stray words that just happen to pass through your mind. You're completely silent but talking to yourself. It's neither thinking nor speaking. It's a sweet spot in between, which is voluntary, but also private. We capture that. Yeah, I've seen that before, too. You can tell some people that are lost in thought, and they're kind of moving their lips and their mouth, but nothing's coming out. So you know they're talking to themselves. So that's basically what you're doing is you're, you're making gestures with your facial mus muscles as if you were talking, but probably in a, a slightly subdued way compared to actually speaking the words and uh, being able to, anybody being able to hear it. So uh, kind of a goofy-looking device. Now, maybe later on, if they can get this down to... A, a smaller size that's the one thing with a lot of these things like the glasses and the other devices like that they just look so goofy attached to people but hey if they can get this down to a little bit uh, smaller of a size maybe it would be a useful computer interface we're getting closer and closer to where uh, maybe 20 years from now there won't be any such thing as a keyboard and a mouse at least unless you're one of the people that like to do something in a nostalgic way so I can see that happening and this is one of the things that would accomplish a goal like that too even if it doesn't end up being the way we do it. it. I think it may end up being more like audio too, but being able to uh, look and read your facial muscles too when you speak quietly would be another thing to add to the mix along with the actual audio input of the of the uh, words that the computer could hear through a microphone or something like that. It could be a combination of a lot of different things. So Great for that. And as usual, all the um, links to all the articles that I'm talking about will be down in the description box below. This next one from space.com, and thank you, Tom H., for sending this article in. A star grazed our solar system 70,000 years ago, and early humans likely saw it. It would have been quite bright in the sky, and there's an artist's depiction here of a, uh, when modern humans and Neanderthals could have been looking up in the sky and seeing this uh, red star. Some distant objects in our solar system bear the gravitational imprint of a small star's close flyby 70,000 years ago when modern humans were already walking the Earth, a new study suggests. And 2015, a team of researchers announced that a red dwarf called Scholz's star apparently grazed the solar system 70,000 years ago, coming closer than one light year to the sun. For perspective, the sun's nearest stellar neighbor these days, Proxima Centauri, lies about 4.2 light years away. The astronomers came to this conclusion by measuring the motion and velocity, velocity of Scholz's star, which zooms through space with a smaller companion, a brown dwarf, or failed star, and extrapolating backward in time. Schultz's star passed by the solar system at a time when early humans and Neanderthals shared the Earth. The star likely appeared as a faint reddish light to anyone looking up at the time, researchers with the new study said. So that's kind of cool, too. It would be kind of cool in a way. You know, I wouldn't want it to pass much closer than that. One light year away is quite a safe enough distance, but it really would be cool to see a star approaching us and uh, staying within one light year for quite a while. But, um, as usual, probably the way they've mapped the sky now, unless something really unusual happens, if it was going to happen anytime soon, we would probably already know about it. And as far as the stuff about Planet X or Nibiru or any uh, Death Star or anything like that coming in and disrupting the planets, forget it, it ain't happening. That's just something, every few years it seems like that thing makes its, uh, uh, that stupid idea makes its return. And speaking of stupid ideas, this is another one that I talked about in a previous TDD report. I didn't know if I was going to actually speak on it or not, but since it's kind of a slow week as far as science news this week, I figured I would touch on it. And this is from Popular Science too, and it's actually a writer I, I typically like, and her writing style is good even in this article, even though I disagree with it, but Sarah Chodash is her name, and this is a, an article from March 23rd, and the title is, IQ is a Really Stupid con Concept. So um, just the title, I mean, irks me because if you know anything about testing and performance testing, pretty much anything that performance tests people in different subjects like math, science, verbal skills, things like that, are types of IQ tests. In fact, the SAT, the AC test, the college entrance exams, your uh, yearly 
or every few years standardized tests in school to uh, gauge uh, performance. They're types of IQ tests. Now, a genuine IQ test obviously measures an IQ with 100 being exactly in the middle of the median IQ and 50% of the population being below that, 50% of the population above that. So if you score an IQ of 100, you're exactly smack dab in the middle. So let me, let me just go over her first uh, paragraph here. Too many of us use the terms IQ and intelligence as if they're interchangeable. They're not. An IQ score isn't a magical signifier of smarts. It merely quantifies your ability to take a particular kind of test. Now that I'm going to disagree with right off the bat. But wealthy white Westerners tend to perform among the best on these exams. Not exactly true. Now she worded it kind of a little bit fudgy there to get away with it, but that's not true either, and I'll address that. But that doesn't mean they're smarter than the rest of the world. And, and that doesn't mean they're smarter than the rest of the world. She's wrong. She doesn't know enough about IQ tests to even get this right. Research increasingly indicates that the advantages that groups enjoy, like better education, health care, get them, set them up for success on such evaluations. Well, yes, of course, that does play into it. If you have decent education and welfare, if you don't have an education level enough to even take a test, like you say, you're not even literate, able to read or write, of course you're going to score low on a test. I think they actually, some IQ tests actually give you five points for signing your name. So if that's the limit that you can just sign your name at the top of the IQ test, your IQ will come out as five because you can't answer any of the rest of the questions because you can't read or write. So, you know, some of the stuff she puts forth here is kind of, uh, it's like, duh, obvious. And it, this thing, as far as this is for wealthy white Westerners, if you actually look at books on IQ tests that talk about different significant groups, like people that self-identify as white, Hispanic, black, East Asian, even let's let's talk about Ashkenazi Jews. There's two groups, Ashkenazi Jews and uh, East Asians score significantly higher than people that self-identify as white. So if you're going to say an IQ test, um, use it as something like that, ridiculous of saying, oh, my race is smarter or something like that. Well, then basically it's showing that uh, white people aren't the smartest ones that if you're using that kind of a way to judge it, you would say, well, East Asians are smarter and uh, Ashkenazi Jews are smarter than white people, but there's such an overlap. I mean, we're talking about tremendous amounts of overlap there. So for any one individual, you couldn't really make that determination. I mean, sure, when you get into real high IQs, now obviously somebody with an IQ of 90 and somebody else with an IQ of 120 or 130, if you were to guess which one would be more successful in life and have a better career, odds are that the one with the higher IQ would but it's not saying they necessarily would. It just saying the odds are a little bit more in their favor. And especially with the group dynamic, you could say if a thousand East Asian people compared to maybe a thousand Hispanic people, um, on the odds, there would be a significantly number of them, at least the way things are laid out right now, that would be more successful than the other group. But there would be a huge amount of overlap in that too. And so for what it's supposed to be, it works absolutely fine. The other thing IQ is for real easily is if you have a group of people you know, don't doesn't matter the group, it can be a totally mixed group. If you have a group of people that all know themselves very well and you ask all of those people, who's the person that's real super smart in your group or who's a person that's a real genius and then you sit down and give all these people IQ tests, the person that everybody says is real super smart will tend to be the, the one with the highest IQ score or at least among the, the couple with the highest IQ score will be related to who people think is the smartest person of the group. And then she even proceeds later on down the article, if you read it, she even proceeds to show how IQ tests can be very useful because she points out the fact that in countries like Kenya, IQ has really gone up since people have had better nutrition, better education, IQs have really gone up in effect. So it says here, today the average IQ in Kenya hovers around 72, slightly lower than a Brit would have scored in 1948. Marks reliably rise in developed nation, increase access to education, health care, and, and food, improves living conditions, and fuels brain development. So yes, you could use IQ as a, an indicator of education levels and brain development in people because obviously if you're disadvantaged and don't get proper nutrition, your brain suffers for it and you're going to be less likely to score high on tests. Um, the other thing that she doesn't even mention in here that uh, if, if you've... Uh, read stories about some of these child geniuses and they could come from any culture they could come from Africa India Asia wherever you will sometimes go to a village and uh, give tests to uh, obviously people that can at least basically take a test and you're going to discover sometimes these childhood geniuses uh, where they're just super smart in math concepts they just grasp them really well science chemistry physics stuff like that and you can actually take these people 
and give them the kind of education so that their genius can flourish and maybe find some inventions for us or, you know, become fantastic teachers or fantastic, you know, in whatever area they are, maybe invent new things, maybe uh, we'll find a genius like that and find a cure for cancer. I mean, that's what we need these IQ tests for. And she's like, well, it just relates to the type of uh, in, uh, post-industrial technological society is what these tests test for. Well, of course, these tests are not to, to try to determine who's the best at, you know, finding berries in a forest. If you're a hunter-gatherer society, you would certainly have a different kind of IQ test to tell who is best at identifying plants and knowing which ones are poisonous and which ones are not. But these tests are geared towards society the way it is right now. And if you want to be successful in, the, in most societies now, it's not going to be by being the best hunter-gatherer. I mean, there may be pockets of that, sure, but if you want to be the best in the society the way it's and now in the technological age, you're going to have to take tests like this, this type of IQ test. So um, if you're using it to brag about and thinking that you're better or something, or one of these people that says, well, I've got an IQ of 150. Oh, yeah, well, I've got a, an IQ of 170. It's not going to necessarily say that you're a better person or even a nicer person. It just says you're able to grasp concepts a little faster than the average person, and you have a slight edge on being successful over the other person. But you could be a total failure. You could be 170 IQ and just be a total failure in life socially and financially and everything. And you could have somebody else with an 80 IQ that's been very successful in life, a uh, very generous, very giving, loving person, and maybe somebody that people would rather spend time with than somebody else. So um, if you want to get a chance to uh, read the article, it is rather interesting. Like I say, this is not to put the author down because a lot of articles I have read by her. She's a very good writer. And even her writing, I would have to say, her writing style, even in this article, it's just her premise and her logics to her argument, especially... I had to deal with this coming from Popular Science Magazine. It's just, um, they got it so, she got it so wrong in this case. And Popular Science more and more is uh, publishing articles like this, I think, more just to get drama views or whatever. So, anyway, that was my rant about that article. If you get a chance, read it over and give me your idea of what you think of this article, too, or where you think I've gotten it wrong, um, or what you think about IQ tests. If you agree with her and think IQ tests are just totally stupid and we shouldn't have any kind of IQ tests of any sort, and I think it's just a waste of time. Put your opinion down. And I would also like to thank everybody on my last TDD report that commented especially about the headlamps and um, have gone out and tested headlamps, gone out and bought headlamps, or in the future somebody said they might even want to send a video in of comparison of headlamps. So I really appreciate the input on that. And I will try as I find gadgets and can test them myself and get a, get a good idea of how much I like the function of the gadget and how much I find it useful. I'm going to try to do more of them. So. That's about it for this week. Take care, everybody. I'll catch you next week.